podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Today's episode will be hosted by Dr. Aaron Elmore. Listeners may remember Dr. Elmore from her multiple guest appearances on the show, and we're happy to announce that she will now be hosting occasional episodes too. Dr. Graham Taylor will still be the regular host of Behavioral Health today, but we're excited to bring you multiple perspective and voices on the show through our guests and now through our hosts. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a triad production. I'm your host, Dr. Erin Elmore, and today I'm joined by Rob Feiner. Rob is a licensed clinical counselor and has a private practice in Torrance, California. He has two decades of experience working with adolescents, athletes, and in coaching diverse individuals. And in 2018, Rob became a father. Congrats, Rob. And since then, he's combined his years of coaching and mental health with his experience fathering and now focuses his practice to include fathers-to-be and their journey to parenthood. So welcome, Rob. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Elmar. Very appreciative and happy to be here. Good. Well, as we get started, why don't you help us set the foundation for your work? So what brought you into the focus of working with fathers-to-be? Okay, so working with fathers-to-be or new dads to, it really was my own experience and the really rough adjustment I went through trying to be a dad and noticing that there at the time, and this was like three years ago, there was nothing out there and nobody really talked about it. If you tried to talk to your guy friends about it, it was even as a therapist, it was like taboo or felt taboo. And my wife, I I went to her with stuff, but she even told me like, it wasn't the time or the place to come to me with that. (laughs) And frankly, it was really difficult. And so after things settled down a bit and I learned a little more about this, Every once in a while, I'd see things popping up through random internet searches about like depression after having kids for for men, what resources were out there for guys to not feel so isolated because it's a couple of things that would occur during that time when your baby's born. And there wasn't much, but then little by little things would come up and I was getting more and more of those clients. And it was one of those, I, I fell into it. And as I was saying before, I use a fair amount of self-disclosure when it comes to talking about this real hard stuff. Because ultimately, a lot of men, fathers, feel very isolated with their feelings. And they don't want to be, and I'm going to use a lot of generalization here, what their dad was. Mm, um, mm-hmm. They don't want to be emotionally distant, but they just don't know how to do that even when they know how to speak about their emotions and they overflow with stuff mm-hmm. and so i provide them with a bit of space where we can manage that but really that's it all great. starts a lot of prep work so i try to do that yeah that's great so really it was your own experience that helped you see there was such a need in, in our field for this particular area that's really impressive yeah So I think when we think fatherhood, everybody thinks of somebody becoming a dad, right? There's that basic understanding. Can you help us understand a little bit of a deeper meaning of what fatherhood is? What does it mean to you when you think of fatherhood? Well, I'll kind of air out the elephant in the room too for your listeners too. Like I'm a cis dude and, you know, I have that perspective on things. And so when coming from that perspective, I think as a, as a guy becoming a dad, you're wanting to make sure that you're able to to be vulnerable with your kids and with yourself and be honest. But also, I think with becoming a dad, it's a learning process, like allowing yourself to have a learning curve and not mm-hmm. feeling like you need to get it wrapped up all in one. And also really in the case where You have a partner trying to help yourself make things as equitable as possible with you and your partner with how we're set up. It's not always, we're not able to be equitable all the time. Like if your partner is breastfeeding, if you have a female partner, if you, if you've adopted, it can be sometimes a little bit easier to make things equitable because there are two able-bodied humans in the house as a dad 
we're trying to take people out of, and for, for me, it's trying to take people out of the passivity of being a dad and being a parent and making them more opt in, like an active participant in, and an active equal partner in raising your kids together. Yeah, I love that terminology, just being an active, intentional parent instead of having fatherhood be something that just sort of happens to you. Yeah, and, and I think you're mentioning beyond just the definition of, oh, now you're a dad for you, you think of also the transition individually with the identity shift, but then also with the family unit, whether that's your partner or if there are other kids already, that type of thing. But yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So can you give us a sense of how you typically work with your clients who are either entering fatherhood or have already entered fatherhood? What's a typical client look like for you and how do you help them? Well, it's, it's usually one of those two. They're either in it and they usually seek me out. Most of the time I've noticed the past couple of years, if they've already had a kid, it's right around three to four months. If they are seeking you know, prior to their, their partner giving birth or going through the adoption process, it'll be like very shortly after that decision is made or that positive pregnancy test comes in. My, my partner says I should talk to someone. That's usually what I get on the phone. And so I really like being that therapist because I'm a link in a chain as far as treatment goes. And so if they decide to go elsewhere for therapy, it would be really nice if they had a positive experience the first time around. Because mm -hmm. uh, I get a lot of newcomers to therapy. And so for dads, when handling them when let's say it's one of the two scenarios the first one is we're pregnant and that's where there's this rush of anxiety and so the nice thing i tell them is we have nine months a little long time close to a year to help get you mentally prepared for this we, mm -hmm. we're gonna dig it all up and get you ready for those first couple of months which are not fun if you bond with your son or daughter off the bat, like all the better, but it doesn't make it any more fun. And we help get you ready over close to a year. It's a lot of prep work. And once it happens, you'll be as ready as you can be without jumping into the pool, so to speak. Yeah. Do you think that's why some people come to you at the third or fourth month mark is like the sleep deprivation is so serious that they're just, they're struggling. Yeah, so yeah, it's nice to prepare yeah. people beforehand if you can and let them know what they're in sure. for. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of talked to them. I said, this is like CII interrogation techniques. <laughs> you will think some thoughts that are going to go dark. And right. Okay. And it's normal during that time. Yeah. 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 Okay. And Good. And on the flip side of things, when I get someone seeking me out around three, four months, it's usually their really, there's just a ton of conflict with their partner. They are feeling so alone and, and they've been so sleep deprived that there's just that triangulation that occurs between, mm -hmm. between partner and the client is seeking me out is on the outside of the triangle. They're just feeling very alone. And oftentimes the, the comment I usually get or the anecdote is like, I can't do anything right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like it, my life is just over. And so we, we work yeah. on that. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of heaviness, isolation, depression, exhaustion in your clients yeah. at this stage. How do you help them move through that? Because it's not like they're going to suddenly get more sleep for a while, you know? So right. how, what are some tools that you can give them to help with this time? I think the first thing is normalizing it. Like mm, realizing where your brain is going, the mindfulness component of basic cognitive therapy is so valuable where your thoughts are just thought. And it's okay if you're up at three o'clock in the morning looking at studio apartments. <laughs> um, and I tell them, I said, it's a really unpleasant place you're at right now. You're being woken up every couple of hours. You're cleaning up poop everybody's in distress all the time. And as I put it, you're the most able-bodied person in the house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, your, your partner just gave birth, went through that extreme trauma. Your child who knew the world as, you know, had walls and it was nice and warm 
it, it, now you're in this world or you're living during a pandemic. It's all really scary for their, their baby too. And kind of getting some education on that too. Right. The baby literally had the mom breathing for it for a long time. And yeah. all of a sudden it literally has to breathe on its own and do everything. Right. It needs help for everything. It's scary for the child as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So helping with that. And then also helping with one of the biggest underlying feelings they get as new parents is helplessness. Mm. That one of the things that was so helpful in understanding is you didn't have to calm your baby down. Mm -hmm. The fact that they can scream in your arms is okay. And it's also okay to, if you need to take a breath, like you can put the baby in the middle of the floor on something soft, turn around and do some deep breathing. And just being able to cope and normalize some of what's going on and knowing that there'll be progress. Like we track it. We say, okay, like baby sleeping four hours in a row right now. Two weeks ago, you would have given an appendage for that much sleep. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So just remembering this alternate universe they're in is time limited. It will get better. It, it yes. is seasonal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I just Good. have a client. Yeah. I have a client right now whose baby is sleeping through the night. Magical. But yeah. He said that is the most life-changing thing that's ever happened. And I Absolutely. said, I know. Been there twice over yes. now. I know. <laughs> Do you have any tips or advice for the couple unit as two partners are trying to figure out parenthood yeah. for the first time? Yeah, I know this is really oversimplifying things, but get some couples therapy before mm. you, you have your baby. Even if things are really good, they're not going to be when you have this baby and you're both regressing to teenagers because mm -hmm. you're you're so sleep deprived so if you have some tools to get through those first part that first part with a couple of therapists is great the other thing i tend to recommend for prospective moms and dads is a resource i tend to relay and it's, i try to say it's not doom and gloom it's just helping put things realistic is a book called how to not hate your husband after having kids such uh, a classic, simple title. I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's by a woman named Jancy Dunn. And I think it helped me a lot because it helped do what Gottman says a lot of the time, which is see the world yes. through partner's eyes. Yes, that's good. And what I tend to say to my clients too is, and this is not a knock on Jancy, she has her own marriage, but I always say like, you're not married to her <laughs> mm, <laughs> because mm -hmm. she... They go to couples therapy in it and Terry Real, the couples therapist in Boston, basically says like, you're being abusive to your husband. You need to mm. cut that out. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's a good resource. Even just listening to, and this is another one, the Gottman interview on the armchair expert with Dax Shepard, just understanding how to use this empathy that you are going to be lacking some of, but gaining some practice and seeing the world through the other person's eyes as much as you can. Yeah, that and, seems really important. The, yeah, the theme yeah. there I'm hearing is understand from your child's perspective, they're just doing what children do, what babies do. It will get better, it will improve. And understanding for yourself and your partner that you're both not at your best for several months after a baby's yeah. born and having that empathy for yourself, but also for your partner so that you don't make them the enemy. That makes a lot of sense. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Behavioral and mental health professionals provide critical support to our communities in a time when our communities need it more than ever. But they need support too, to continue their education, to connect with colleagues, and to advance their career. And so we've launched Triad, the hub for behavioral and mental health professionals. At Triad, you'll find education, community, and career resources for both current and aspiring behavioral and mental health professionals, all curated specifically for you and all for free. Visit us at hellotriad.com BHT to register for your free professional account. Again, that's hellotriad.com BHT. Come join the community today. 
do you find that your approach shifts at all if you're working with really young first-time fathers, like maybe teenagers who weren't expecting to be a parent or young adults? Is, is there any input you have in that situation? Definitely. It's tough when, when you're working with younger folks and because they might not have the resources someone who's established does. Yeah. Most of the time they don't. And so when working with them, it is one of those things where we do take it from that, okay, we have a lot of time to get used to this, but we also want to be real about it. And so I'm a little more gentle with, with younger folks where it's like, hey, if you need to go play video games till like three o'clock in the morning to start moving towards an acceptance point with this, because most of the time with younger folks, and I'm going to generalize, like it is very unplanned and mm -hmm. very grieving. And mm -hmm. I have to, as their therapist, be very gentle with that. At, at a point, we're, we're going to keep the discussion going. And at a point, there's going to be a, an acceptance point where it's like, okay now concrete like what are we gonna do what's the plan in small increments and oftentimes there's a little bit of case management that goes on too i would think so just trying to find yeah. support that they, they don't have to do it entirely on their own yeah i love yeah. the the point you brought up about the grief because it's true and even if it's something that's exciting in our lives that huge change brings a little bit of grief because it's the end of something when it's the beginning of something else so i imagine yeah. even for couples who are really looking forward to being parents and having children there still is grief about the end of their life as they know it end of sleep yeah. end of everything that they're used to right but then i yeah, yeah I imagine the weight of that is so heavy for young fathers people who weren't entirely expecting this to happen at this time in yeah. their life that's huge yeah, yeah. There's a movie I relay to a lot of people. It seems super campy, and it is at times, but I, I give the background actually on my own experience with the movie too, which is uh, Marley and Me. Yeah. And everybody goes, the one with the dog? And I say, yeah, yeah the one with the dog. And uh, I say, the dog is just background. But what we want to look at is, and I'm not spoiling anything, but it's we want to look at the changes that occur here. Well, one person had it in their mind on what they wanted out of their life, and it took a change. But what I tend to do with all new dads and prospective dads is, when you think about it, this is the most significant thing that's probably happening in your life, where you will now, if all goes according to plan, be responsible for this human being and helping them create a life for themselves and you don't even know them you mm -hmm. haven't met them and you're sacrificing all this stuff and you don't know them but you will and mm -hmm. so it's the idea of giving them a chance that i work with a lot of men on when they think my life is over i won't be able to do these things all the, i'm losing 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 and we're not focusing on what we're gaining because we don't know them yet and yeah. what i say i never use the i even i poke fun at the people you'll know when you have one and i usually have a choice phrase for that that's colorful like i said i'm a new york <laughs> for folks like that but what i do say is what if we gave them a chance just thinking with your curious mind, what would that be like if you gave it a chance, the idea to sink in a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. It's really almost that what we call dialectical where you're holding two opposite things, right? It's holding the grief of, wow, whether this was planned or not planned, this is a huge change, like takes a lot of self-sacrifice and suddenly you are not the most important person in your life anymore forever. And then also all these wonderful beautiful things that can come out of it like such a such a beautiful unique relationship being able to be the dad the provider the protector and holding both of those at the same time yeah sure. that's great what are some i mean you're already kind of headed this direction but what are some examples of transformation that you've seen in your clients i mean it sounds like you're talking about that shift from grief to hope and to acceptance what mm -hmm. else have you seen that's just really inspiring as you help fathers step into that role I think the, the one thing, and this is, I'm going to steal a page out of John Kim, the angry therapist. I like his work and he has this expression that I just really like. 
you would see this shift from boy mind to man mind. Mm, yes, and yes. That's something I'm really, really stoked when I see that happen for a lot of clients, which in essence, you're shifting from self, soul self-interest. And that's something I also really normalize, which is like, how were you raised? What was it like in your home? What did your mom do? I mean, I grew up in the 80s. I'm 41 now. I grew up in the 80s and I had a, a Jewish mom who picked up after every, if you ever watched the Goldbergs, like Beverly Goldberg, like mm -hmm. that is my mom. Like for me to transition into from boy mind to man mind, I still work with that at times. Yeah. I, I still have to dial it in when I get tired and like, I'm like, let's play lay down daddy games because I'm not moving. It's like, oh, <laughs> get through the next two hours. And yeah. so what I, what I see is so impressive is when they do dig, when they say, okay, like, I know I'm tired, but someone needs me right now. The other part that's inspiring too is when they get out of the self-criticism when they do slip. You know, I, I heard the baby crying and then she got up and I know she's tired, but I'm just so tired and I, I just wanted to sleep and I said, okay, it's all right. And, and they go, I know, I know. Sometimes I fall off a little bit, but we hop back on again and not go into like extreme self-criticism is really, really nice. Yeah. And that's really impressive, especially if they're sleep deprived and having all of that, that emotion to work through. That's when our inner critic gets so strong. That must be really encouraging. Those little moments where they're able to say, you know what? It's okay. It's not the end of the world. I have plenty of other chances to do this better next time. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. On a bigger scale, have you noticed any changes in trends with fatherhood, whether it be the pandemic recently or we're sort of having a departure from a traditional nuclear family, you know, this generation as opposed to a few ago? Are, are you noticing any trends in your clients or trends in the, the nuclear family, if you will? Yeah, a little bit of both. I think with the clients, it's like we were speaking about earlier, they're going more towards opt-in or if they seek me out and they're struggling with this, I can't do anything right. A lot of them are sole career focused. You know, they'll say, hey, if we just get through the next five years and we make X amount of money, we'll be clear sailing. And I said, we live in Los Angeles, so I'll say, yeah, you have all that money and you're living in the divorce towers in Santa Monica, right by Ocean Park Boulevard, right next to Larry <laughs> David. So we could do that, or you could like continue on your life, but maintain your relationship. And I think with the pandemic, it's the relationships people are starting to see, like that's all you really have. And yeah. so even with the non-traditional or even co-parent. I've had clients who are co-parents where it was planned and how I've navigated that is working through a non-contentious divorce, but we're working backwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you were never together to begin with. You didn't want to be. You both wanted a child and you're giving that child love, but it is now like a, like a bit of a business agreement when you're parenting. And so it's working that out too. So I've come across that. I found that something that's really interesting and presents its own set of challenges too. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And I imagine, I mean, maybe you can speak to this a little bit, but I imagine fathers in particular may lean heavily on that role of providing when they have a child and feel that pressure of like, okay, now I really need to show up at work and bring home the bacon, if you will. Whereas women are fully like, I'm, I'm at home, I'm nurturing, like not even thinking about work very much, just biologically, there's that difference. So I like mm -hmm. how you were mentioning part of the work is to keep that in its proper place. Cause that is part of being a dad is providing and protecting, but also making sure it's not at the cost of the relationship and the family yeah. unit. That's great. Yeah. 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 That was, that was my own mistake. My daughter was born right before I took my licensing exam. Oh, terrible exam. timing. That's the worst timing possible. It was the worst. And I took my license exam when she was four weeks old. Wow. Uh, I was a terror around the house because I was nervous and frustrated and and all of it was, was 
just, we have to double our income. I have to get, you know, up from supervision, even though I love my supervisors, but my income would double. We'd have this. And it took its toll on our marriage. It really did. And we did our own couples work and at times still work on it. Like if it does come up, there's repercussions of doing that. And I do share that with clients. Like there are long-term repercussions that can come from this stuff. So it's important that, you know, taking a page on like ACT, we take a look at our values and actually stick to them. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. I'm sure our listeners appreciate that vulnerability because, you know, sure. if you learn all this stuff by mistakes, right? <laughs> that's how life Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and as you think on your experience as a father, and then also your experience helping people in your, in your work, is there anything that you would want to tell to our listeners? Like, is there any advice you would like to give to fathers to be right now? Fathers to be is that, again, there's a long time between I'm pregnant and when you have your baby. There's a long time because my wife and I actually looked into adoption. It could be a very long time before you have a child in your home. So we have time, and with that is the best piece of parenting advice I ever heard, which was everything is a phase. It's all a phase. It's going to change. And so we want, like how I said about the sleep, like let's look, take some inventory of where we're at with it. And that helps me immensely as a dad. That's oh. great advice. Yeah. Yeah. Cause when you're trying to manage multiple things, it's not doing everything perfectly, right? It's figuring out what's the right thing in this season at this time. Absolutely. That's Got wonderful it. advice. Yeah. Well, as we're wrapping up today, are there any resources that you'd want to mention for our listeners? I know you already mentioned a couple of good books and good oh, movies, sure. but fill us in if there's anything else of interest. Oh, yeah. So the JMC Dunn book, how to not hate your husband after having kids. And the other one I really, really liked was Pacify Me, a handbook for the freaked out new dad by Chris Mancini. I read that one. And what I usually tell all clients is that read these in pieces. Don't feel like you have to buzz through these. Take them in small bites because it's a lot of information to take it. Another one that I really like is uh, Armchair Expert uh, with Dax Shepard, the John Gottman interview. That's a really wonderful interview. And I've had clients like, it sounds like your dad. And I'm like, I'm from New York and I'm Jewish. Like we all sound alike. And so that's one that I really like too. And I would say like, let's listen to that with your partner. Another one that's really good. There's a book called Husband on Purpose mm. that I was a big fan of. Not written by a therapist, but it's got these pieces you can pick from. And then the last one... I, I always recommend the couple is Hold Me Tight by Dr. Sue Johnson. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, that one is just so great for men, I think, to read just because as dudes were so used to culturally fixing things. Like it's embedded in like a patriarchal way of doing things that were like, we need to fix set emotion aside. And we learned that that's not the way things really need to work through reading a book like that. I've had clients that say, I pick a cheat code. Like we, we actually talk about things now. Coding that language barrier between men and women. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a great one. And then the one I, this is the big one. And it's not so much a resource, but a piece of advice is the first couple of months have a show that is very easily digested that is just you don't care about that you can binge watch and it's i always ask people what they watch and i find it really interesting i bet yeah 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 like a lot of people see office but some folks will go like for me it was that show alone if that's like a peek into my psyche at the time sure like, sure you know they're 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 i i haven't eaten in seven days and I caught this rabbit and I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to feed this baby at 3 a.m. and I'm trying not to lose my mind. I bet that really uh, relates to the primal instincts going uh, on in, in early yeah, parenthood and being absolutely. alone in the wilderness. That's pretty yeah. funny. That's so, some great so, yeah, advice. That's a big one. Yeah. Find a show that's easily digested. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let, no pressure. You don't have to talk and have an argument. You just sit together and watch a show. I love that. 
Sure. Yeah. That's yeah great. Definitely. So Rob, if anyone is interested in learning more about you and your practice, where can they find you? That's a really good question. So really easy. It's just robfiner.com. So R-O-B, F is in Frank, E-I-N-E-R.com. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Rob. I think this is an area, as you mentioned, that's just not talked about very much. And it's so important. You know, a lot of the focus is on the mother, I think, during this time, which is, is rightfully so. There's a lot going on with yeah, her. But yeah, definitely. it's a huge role for fathers, too. So thank you for sharing all your insights and experience. Really meaningful. Oh, my my pleasure. Yeah, it was, it was a pleasure, too. Oh, and before I forget, one thing to throw a liner notes too. Yes, the, let's let's um, hear. But Mike Burbiglia, the stand-up comic, had a had a stand-up comedy routine called the the new one, okay. which I think is really good. It's about him and his partner and how he never wanted to have kids, and she all of a sudden said, "I want a kid," and how that worked. The whole narrative is about that. I thought it, it was brilliant. Yeah, I, I, I recommend that one too. Okay, great. We'll add that one to our show notes. That's so great. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Rob. Appreciate oh, it. Such a pleasure, Dr. Omar. Yeah. You're so welcome. You. And thank you to our listeners. We really appreciate you being here with us today too. And we look forward to having you back with us the next time on Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community. And if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.